Welcome to all of you tonight's talk on democracy in danger. We wait just another second and see, yeah, people are coming in. So let's wait a little bit more. Yeah, here they are coming. Okay. Okay, so welcome again, everybody. And so let's start, yeah. Again, a warm welcome to all of you to tonight's talk on democracy in danger, question mark. My name is Christiane Püker. I'm the director of the German American Center here downtown Stuttgart. And together with the Mannes-Zentrale für politische Bildung, we are dedicating a two-day special to democracy. And this panel is one of them. Earlier today, we had a workshop for high school students. And tomorrow morning, we'll have a conversation with German and American diplomats talking about the importance of diplomacy for democratic processes. That's for um, university students. And the timing is no co coincidence. Um, today, January 27th is the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. One of the many lessons we need to take away from the horrors of World War II is how important it is to protect democracy and our democratic values. Yet 76 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, we have an upsetting number of individuals here in Germany protesting COVID policies by comparing them to living under a dictatorship. According to a study that the Körber Stiftung here in Germany released in December 21, only 50% of Germans have confidence in democracy, just 50, and 30% trust it less or not at all. The pandemic seems to have fueled populism that had already been on the rise in Germany, other European countries and abroad. Populism, criticism of the political establishment, disenchantment with elections and anti-democratic positions in society are expressions of dissatisfaction for the government and the system in many countries. And we saw what can happen when sentiments like these escalate in the US with the attack on the Capitol building in January of 21 last year. So for tonight's discussion, we invited political experts that will talk about the state of our democracies in the US and in Europe and explore whether they are in fact in danger. Our panelists tonight are from the Technical University Dresden, Professor Dr. Marianne Knoyer, and um, from the World Justice Project and the Brookings Institution, Ted Picona. The conversation will be moderated by Dr. Martin Kielbus from the IFA Academy here in Stuttgart. Martin is a political scientist, journalist, and moderator specializing, among others, in international relations and social diversity. He studied in Stuttgart and Washington, DC. And today, he is an advisor to the European Commission a project manager and conducts training courses for the German Foreign Office. And he is going, Martin, you will go to uh, introduce the panelists later on. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, Marianne, Ted and Martin. And for the audience, we have planned the panel discussion for about hmm, approximately 45 minutes. And after which we look forward to our audience questions. Before I now hand over to you, Martin, please let me add for the audience that already during the talk, our listeners can use the Q&A or Frage und Antwort button to type in questions. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible after the talk. So please join in with your questions. If you feel more comfortable asking the questions in German, you can do so. And Martin is going to translate them. And please note um, that throughout the event, um, you won't be able to turn on your microphone and your camera. That's for the audience. And now, Marianne, Ted, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you.
Yes, thank you very much, Cristiano, for this lovely introduction and also for yeah, describing a bit what we will discuss about today, tonight for, as we said, for about 45 minutes, and then we're gonna open up the floor. And I will take this chance just to briefly introduce our two guests. I'm gonna start with Marianne. As uh, Christiane already mentioned, Marianne is a full professor of comparative politics at the Institute of Political Science with the Technical University in Dresden. Uh, she's been there for about a year now. Before that, she's been, she was with the University of Hildesheim and there she used to have the position of the director of the Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, she was in that position from 2012 to 2019 and her career also led her from the Arizona State University, the universities of Air Force, Darmstadt and Hagen and finally to the Technical University in Dresden. And the main fields of academic research of Marianne covers democracy and autocracy studies, also regime change and democratic erosion. And a second big strand of her academic research is digitalization, digital communication and net politics. And interestingly enough, uh, Marianne also used to work has some background experience as a political journalist and maybe for some of our German members of the audience, she also used to be a speechwriter for our former federal president Roman Herzog. And from Dresden University, we're going to hop over to Transatlantic Ocean to Ted. Welcome Ted in Washington DC. It's really great having you with us tonight over here. It's night <laughs> midday in Washington DC. And uh, Ted is a non-resident senior fellow in the foreign policy program with Brookings, the Brookings Institution, and he's the chief engagement officer at World Justice Project, an independent nonprofit organization dedicated to the strengthening of the rule of law. He's been with Brookings for around 11 or 12 years now, and during the time he also used to be a senior fellow with the Charles Robinson Chair, a visiting fellow with the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin, which is actually funded by the Robert Bosch Foundation located here in Stuttgart. His research actually covers global democracy, rule of law, human rights, US Latin American uh, relations, and much more. He also used to serve as senior foreign policy advisor at the State Department, at the National Security Council and the Pentagon. And he holds honorable degrees from Columbia University's law school and the University of Pennsylvania. And when you kind of prepare today's meeting, all of us found, well, there's so much to talk about. We could like fill the entire evening. However, we don't want to scare people off. And our idea was that we will in this 45 minutes try to cover, let's say, four main topics. I mean, we will try to do our best because each and any of these topics could feel like semesters of lectures. We will try to squeeze it down a bit, be yeah, short and precise. So first of all, we of course will talk about what are the main dangers of democracy, of our Western democracies today? What are the main challenges? And actually, what are we talking about when we use this term? democracy? Do we have a shared understanding of what we mean when we talk, when we speak about democracy? And of course, we also want to talk about how do we deal with those people who actually are unhappy with our democracy, who even fight our democracy, who have different ideas about democracy? And what can we do to build resilience, democratic resilience? And how can we strengthen our democracy? Is there something like education for democracy? This is what we briefly want to talk about tonight. It sounds like a lot. We will try our best. I know that Ted and Marianne both are excellent speakers. And the first challenge today is that I kindly ask the two of you for two brief introductory statements. And we're going to start with you, Marianne. And actually, this first brief introductory statement can be used just to, let's say, knock upon some of the main issues of tonight. And my question for you, Marianne, is how would you actually describe, based on your current experience, the state of democracy here in Germany or in the European Union as of today? 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I want to thank the Deutsche Amerikanische Zentrum for organizing this event and for having me. I think the topic is more than timely and highly relevant, and I'm very much excited to, to exchange with uh, Ted and you, Martin, and the audience. And of course, I hope that this statement doesn't count into my three minutes. Um, let me start um, by saying uh, that I'm a scholar of comparative politics and therefore I will, of course, talk about Germany, but also about developments in, in Europe and beyond. I think it's quite natural to look at one's own country um, asking for dangers and uh, of democracy, but it's also good to have a bigger picture. So um, actually uh, talking about the state of democracy, you asked me, uh, Martin, uh, I would say, I would like to make three short points. The first point is erosion of democracy. I, I think this is one of the dangers we are facing uh, right now, and, and this is worldwide. What means erosion of democracy? It means that legally elected leaders guided by an authoritarian style and an illiberal mindset start to change the democratic rules of the game, purposefully dismantling democratic institutions and curtailing democratic principles. And the problem is that this process evolves in an incremental and sequenced way so that it is difficult to discern. We witness this kind of what I call slow death of democracy, not only in various countries, again, worldwide, but also in relevant countries with big populations, such as Brazil, India, Turkey, Philippines, and also if we talk about the Trump administration uh, in the United States of America. And it is certainly concerning that with Hungary and Poland, we have also, also two cases within the EU. Second, um, while erosion of democracy certainly is a problem of elites, my second item refers, or my second concern and my second danger refers to citizens and their growing distance to the state and their growing distance to democracy. Of course, they're two different things, but if they come together, the potential danger increases. What we can observe is that citizens do not trust their states in the same way they did 10 or 20 or 40 years ago. Some question even the authority of the state and its representatives, and this not only refers to politicians, but also to police, to fire workers, and to other representatives of the state. It, it not only refers to, to, the, to the sphere of, of politics. And this is, I think, highly problematic. So if this goes together with an anti-democratic thinking, as we can observe in some of the anti-corona protests in Germany, then this mix becomes, in the real sense of the word, uh, explosive. Thirdly, COVID-19. Looking at the overall picture, actually we can uh, not confirm that there is a huge effect, negative effect on the status of democracy by the pandemic. So actually the direct effect has been limited so far. There are indeed countries that um, exploited the situation for severe steps towards more authoritarianism. But this is the minority. This is a good news. But on the other hand side, in some societies, societies, the pandemic has triggered indirect effects. And these have become catalysts for what I mentioned before, namely more distrust uh, in the state, more polarization, et cetera. So the COVID-19 pandemic, we are still in it and we have to observe it, but uh, it can serve as a trigger, as a catalyst for some very worrisome uh, developments. So I leave it here. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's already a lot to talk about, especially, I mean, we will touch this later again, the erosion of democracy, the distance between state citizens, the people. And of course, we also need to talk about the COVID-19 impact, whatever this impact may be. You already kind of draw a bit the line. But Ted, having a look at the US, what is the state of democracy as of today in the United States of America? 
Well, thank you, Martin, and thank you, Chris Ampeka, for inviting me to join you all today. And I'm I'm sorry we're not doing this in German. My language skills are not good enough. Um, so thank you for your patience in doing this in English. I'm happy to join you, uh, Marianne, for this discussion. Um, so, you know, I would just say I'm generally an optimist, and I've devoted many years of my career to the idea that democratic governance and human rights and the rule of law are the best possible form of government. Um, it seems rather obvious to me, and we should be not only working to strengthen democracy at home, but also abroad. But over the last several years, and living here in Washington during the trauma of the Trump years, I honestly have become more of a pessimist. I, I say that as it relates specifically to the unique features of American democracy and the way it is performing. But I also say it in the context of a rising China, um, feeling more confident and assertive about its very different form of government. And also when you look as Marianne pointed out around the world, the steady erosion of democracy, including in some very big important countries. And I would add India and maybe South Africa to that list as well. So on the one hand, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, it's a nation of immigrants and it was founded on important principles of equality and separation of powers that have basically served it well, although it's been very slow in um, making progress toward those goals. Um, but here we are, a, a, a strong multi-ethnic republic with high levels of economic and social development and human development and technological and industrial achievements. Um, that has something to do with a democratic system of government. On the other hand, our system has some real quirks in, in English, uh, strange features um, that are not so democratic, uh, like the electoral college, the way our president is chosen, um, which is too complex to get into in this, in this call. Um, the way in which we allocate voting districts is very partisan in many places, and it varies from state to state. We have a very weak regulation of money in politics. The Supreme Court has declared money is speech, and much of that money flowing into our politics is hidden. It's dark money. And so there are you know, really important power disparities in terms of how our politics is conducted. And I think all of this and many other things are hampering our ability to manage our disagreements. And disagreements are inevitable in democracies in any human society. Question is how do you manage them? Through violence and conflict or through dialogue and compromise? Um, and I would say on, on those criteria, democracy in the United States is in danger and, and elsewhere. And in fact, the program tonight is um, democracy in danger question mark, I would say exclamation point. Democracy is in danger. And I'll have more to say about that later. Thank you, Ted, for this really brief summary of the situation and your analysis of the state of democracy in the US, I think. When we were briefly talking to each other, the three of us yesterday, I think we all share that we are optimistic people, but despite our optimism, we, as you described, can briefly note that there's, there are many things happening right now, which just turned the level over to being a little bit more pessimistic. But we all have been talking about democracy now. And uh, you, Ted, you mentioned China. And I wanna share with you a very brief yeah, experience I had the other day. And I want to just come down to the point, what are we talking about when we speak about democracy? Of course, I think we all share a Western understanding of democracy based on European and American values and the freedom of the individual. I had a meeting with a group of Chinese students. They all were extremely well educated, intelligent, and also open enough to speak. And one of these Chinese guys stood up and said, well, I believe that China has a better democratic system than Germany has. 
because, I mean, we have a parliament, we have a right to vote, but of course we have a stronger state. And in times of crisis, with a pandemic crisis, such a democratic system is much, is much better than the one we have in Germany. So talking about democracy, Mariana, because you are the one focusing also on the comparative approach of democracy. What is the understanding the three of us try to share tonight when we speak about democracy? Because I think we all know China is not a democracy in our understanding, but how come that 70% of the people living in China say, we are happy with our democracy? Well, uh, I mean, uh, as a citizen of Germany, uh, I've been living uh, quite some time in a divided country where one part uh, declared itself to be the democratic um, Republic of Germany and the other part, the, the Federal Republic of Germany, as you all know. So um, with this experience, we also know that declaring something democratic does not make it democratic. So, um, and the same applies to, of course, to several countries. Um, Actually, yes, there, first of all, we have to simply say democracy is a big concept and it's a contentious concept. I mean, it's the same as uh, talking about justice or um, freedom or whatever. I mean, you, you, you can, it's, it's just a big concept. Um, this uh, as a first point, but looking at the realities, <clears throat> we have indeed uh, several big definitions of democracy. And um, one of it is rather, I would say minimal. So there we, we can have some minimal standards like elections. And of course we know that elections are vital to democracy. So the elections are a critical, critical element of, election, of democracies. So actually elections are, uh, um, minimum, a procedural minimum for democracies. But as we could also find in the last decades, elections are not enough to make, to make a country a democracy. So this is one lection, uh, we, one lesson we learned um, because um, decades of, yeah, decades, scholars thought, okay, if a country has elections, this was also a basis for the um, US-American uh, um, promotion of democracy approach uh, to encourage elections. And then, okay, we have elections and this is already democracy. This is not the case. I mean, elections are not enough to make a country a democracy. This is also a lesson we learned. We need more. We need um, uh, some liberal values. So what we are talking about nowadays is liberal democracy. It's, it's not only electoral democracy, so democracy with elections, fair and free elections, this is fine, but not enough. It's liberal democracy. If you want to say so, it's a thick understanding of democracy. So what, what makes this is protection of individual and minority, minority rights. It's a strong rule of law, and it's uh, checks and balances on executive powers. So these elements um, in, in the nowadays understanding uh, would make a liberal democracy. Just coming back on that, let's say checks and balances and the concepts of a liberal democracy, rule of law to get you in Ted again. Uh, Many people today say, well, many of these elements are in crisis. We do not only have a pandemic crisis or we have the climate crisis. We also have a crisis of democracy. But is this really true? Is our democracy in crisis? Or do we have, from your point of view, a democracy in times of crisis? Good. I, I think, um, first of all, Marianne's um, a uh, very important explanation of thin and thick democracy is right on point. So thank you for that. Um, um, I would just add uh, a couple of additional elements and then I will answer your question, Martin. Um, it is a complex concept and it's easily easily manipulated by illiberal leaders. Um, you know, everyone wants to be seen as a Democrat. 
So think about the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. North Korea is the farthest thing from a, from a democracy in its common understanding. I also would back, try to avoid the, uh, it's a Western concept. Um, it's really, uh, you see democracy everywhere in every culture, in every region around the world, from Indonesia and India to Brazil and parts of Africa, et cetera. And certainly we've also seen authoritarian type governments in the West and the North. So um, that's another important point to, to underscore. And then I would also underscore the important point of equal treatment before the law, that we are all equal regardless of what power you have in society. And um, you know that unfortunately remains an ideal. And this is the center point of a lot of um, conflict. And one of the reasons we're in danger is because we've lost the ability to see everyone as equals. And there are many other identities that are interfering with um, that fundamental golden rule of treating everyone as if you, the way you would want to be treated. Um, and and you, when you add that to money and politics, as I said before, you have special interests that are um, turning the system to their advantage. And then just a word about rule of law. I mean, I see rule of law as the foundation for um, effective democracy and protection of human rights. Um, you know, everyone is accountable to the law, uh, regardless of, of your status, that the laws themselves are just, they respect human rights, and that they're created through an open and, and fair process. And when there are disputes, they are resolved by independent courts and open proceedings. And all that sounds simple. Um, in practice, it's very difficult. And um, perfection is impossible. Uh, President Biden recently um, made a speech on the International Day of Democracy when he was announcing plans for the Global Summit for Democracy that was held just last year in, in December. No democracy is perfect. No democracy is ever final. Every gain that's made is the result of you know, very hard work. Um, so when you think about your question about um, are we in a crisis or you know operating yeah, our democracy crisis, right crisis. I think it, I think it's both I think it's both so there are studies one after the other by independent sources that show that democracy as we've discussed it liberal democracy is backsliding it's eroding it's you know last week there was another coup in Africa. That's one of the most kind of traditional forms of uh, interruption of democracy, but we see it um, in some very older established democracies as well. And I think that is an empirical, um, uh, which have a lot of confidence in that evidence um, because it's being repeated through many different independent sources. Uh, where I work at the World Justice Project, we produce a rule of law index that includes many yeah. democracy factors. And we're finding a steady erosion in the rule of law in the majority of countries around the world. Now, we are living in a moment of crisis. Um, certainly the pandemic is a public health crisis and it has really, I think, hurt um, our democratic, the, the trust in democracy, the trust in government. Um, but even the basic functions of, of government, you know, providing public services, um, whether it's schools or public health clinics or the courts and the delays in justice that people are facing because people can't get to the court and we don't have the digital tools everywhere to manage that, that relationship. So I feel that we're already in a crisis before the pandemic hit and things have gotten worse. With all the stuff Mariana Ted just mentioned, with just this, let's say, decay of democratic principles, the decay of services offered by the government, by the state, uh, you and your introductory statement mentioned this growing distance between the citizens, the people, and the democracy, the state, the government. Do you think that the same is true for Germany, for the European Union, what, from your point of view, are the main reasons that we have this gap, this lack of trust and confidence of the people, the citizens, into our democratic systems? 
Well, first of all, I I would like to also um, make a point on the question if if we are really sure. if democracy is really in crisis right. because or, I yeah I think uh, it it would be interesting. Ted and I agree in in a lot of points, uh, um, and um, I think it would be maybe interesting to make here some kind of controversy mm-hmm. so that uh, it becomes a little bit more that the discussion gets a little bit more of pepper. So um, in order to I to bring come back some... to that a bit later, but go ahead <laughs> now, that's absolutely perfect and fine with me, yeah. So in order to bring some pepper into the discussion, I, I have to say that I generally have a problem with this proliferation of crisis scenarios regarding democracy. If we look into the history uh, of democracy and listen to the great thinkers, then the takeaway is that democracy apparently never has not been in crisis. So, um, I mean, um, we can look only into the 20th century and and have all these crisis uh, discussions on, on democracy, capitalism, and so on. So I wonder if the notion of crisis of democracy does really help us in any way to make clear assessments about the state of democracy at any point of time. Uh, so therefore, I'm reluctant to use the, um, to agree that we are in a crisis of democracy, but because if we would agree to that, we would have to say, okay, we always have been in crisis with democracy. Why? Because democracy is a very difficult uh, political system. Is It's a very demanding, it's a very onerous, and uh, it's simply complicated to to keep it alive because it needs so much um, prerequisites. It so it requires so much hard work. So actually it's this is the case and I mean and and but this is at the same time the benefit of democracy. So therefore I would um I'm I'm reluctant to use the the word of 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 crisis. Um and then talking about the citizens and um I'm sorry that my um, and talking about the citizens, I, I have to say, for me, it's very important to make a distinction between the idea of democracy and then the concrete performance of democracy. So what we can see in, in surveys, and this goes around, I mean, this is uh, referring to Germany, but also to Europe and to most of the countries, we can see quite a distinction or quite a difference in in what people feel about the idea of democracy and what they feel about the concrete performance of their governments in their countries. And I give you an example. Uh, This refers now to Germany. So um, uh, recent surveys about Germany, and you just mentioned it, uh, or uh, Christiane mentioned it in her introduction, Uh, tells us that the support for democracy as an idea in Germany is 93%. So 93% of the German population thinks that democracy is a good idea, which should be supported. There is only a slight difference between West and East. If we then ask if people are satisfied how democracy is enshrined into the constitution, uh, in the German constitution, the Grundgesetz, there we have 76% of the Germans who are supporting that the democracy is well enshrined in our Grundgesetz. Here we have a bigger difference between East and West. And now comes the interesting thing, asking for satisfaction how democracy concretely performs in Germany it's only 57%. This is the number you mentioned. So for me, this is a very important difference because it shows us the difference because uh, of the general idea people follow. This is the idea of democracy and everything, all the values that are included into this big concept. And then on the other hand side, and here's the problem, the satisfaction with the concrete performance uh, of the governments, which is quite low with uh, 57% is low. And here I would like to also mention the difference between West and East. West Germany, 62%, and East Germany, 41. 
This means 41% in East Germany of the citizens are satisfied with the performance of democracy in Germany. And this is the, I mean, this low number of, of satisfaction with the concrete how democracy works in the countries. And this is, I mean, you can take Germany, but then you can take other um, European countries. It's the same, the same That's difference. True. I. As a brief question to come in to fully understand it, and I'm yeah. going to hand over to Ted in a second, but do you know, do we have any data where this comes from? Let's say this dissatisfaction, this unhappiness with the performance of democracy? Yeah, it's, I mean, this is a, <laughs> this is a big question. I mean, Ted can also, uh, I'm sure, refer to this because it, it I think it's the same in, in United States and, and as I said, in most societies. Um, the the point is that most of the people really again follow the idea of democracy so this also tells us this that democracy still is an appealing attractive concept for most of the people in most of the countries of this world but that we have problems with the concrete performance how governments deliver and i think this is the problem do governments deliver is this the drama of the Trump administration or the leftover of the Trump administration, what they basically did to democracy in the U.S., Ted? Uh, there are different views on whether this all, you know, Trump yeah. was the consequence of problems that preceded him mm -hmm. um, or, you know, and then he kind of lit the fire and just kind of. And it just, yeah. It worse, right. right. Um, and I, I want to. That was really interesting to hear the statistics in, in Germany. After spending some time in Germany during my fellowship, I left the country feeling that this is a very unbalanced, comparatively healthy democracy. I look now at the United States, and those numbers show. Uh, I wish I, I wish we had those numbers in our polling, um, even on the idea of democracy. We're seeing. Polls, I don't have the numbers on my fingertips, but we're seeing polls that show that young people in particular don't care as much about democracy as older generations. Maybe because they didn't have to fight for it as much as the World War II generation and, and subsequently. But they are willing to accept um, even a greater role of the military in executive power in this country, which is a bit shocking. Um, so I think there's something, and maybe when we come to civic education, we'll, we'll come back to that. The other, I would add two other elements. Maybe you'll, you'll ask this anyway, I'm jumping ahead, but why am I concerned? Why do I think we've entered a crisis? There's, there, there are things that are a little different now. The levels of polarization in this country have become so extreme that it's becoming harder and harder to identify the path out of the crisis. That's where I think there's a tipping point. And there's some new research that's just come out from Jennifer McCoy um, and others on this that you might want to look at. The um, depolarization uh, of very polarized societies um, becomes more and more difficult the more polarized the societies are. And what I'm seeing in our system is a certain um, rigidity uh, or fragility in our ability to walk back from those extremes and come to some common ground. And it's not just political, it's cultural as well. You see it in the way people are choosing to live, in what kinds of neighborhoods, um, the products that they buy, uh, their identities and their own self-branding, which the internet provides everyone is quite interesting. Um, and related to that, of course, the big X factor that we have not seen in the past quite the same way is social media and digital technology, that it has um, this turbocharged ability to polarize people even further, and it's written into the algorithms. It is set up by businesses as a way to drive traffic and advertising revenue to be more extreme, to call attention to the naysayers, the negatives, the violence. And this is really harming us because we've lost the ability to find a common information source that people trust. And that is also a piece of the fragmentation um, that feels like it's, it's we're losing control uh, of that common experience and common ground in which we can 
uh, resolve these differences uh, peacefully. I mean, this is an excellent point to hand over to Marianne again, because she's also has her special strand of research and digitalization. Uh, I know that we very often blame the internet and the social media for all the bad things happening in our world and our societies today. But on the other side, we all do stay in our filter bubbles. We all stay in our little social media villages or social media families. And we are much less exposed to the others, to also meanings which may contradict our own meaning, our own perceptions. And of course, being in the internet, being online as we are today, we don't have to compromise that often because normally we, uh, we do stay in our own filter bubbles. So what is the influence, the impact of digitalization on the state of democracy in our countries right now from your point of view, Mariana? Well, first of all, um, uh, I totally agree to Ted uh, about the effect of um, social media communication that mm -hmm. it's uh, definitely um, supporting polarization in, in societies and all what he said, I can definitely confirm. Um, and I, I even think that um, the promise that the web uh, 2.0 uh, technology had, which was uh, more equality, more inclusion uh, and so on, that this is turning against. So actually we have more divides. Um, women are much more, uh, much less included, or if they are included, they're uh, harassed or, or uh, discriminated against and so on. So I, I think the divides are becoming bigger and, and, um, and uh, it's more about exclusion than inclusion. So I absolutely agree. Um, on the other hand side, um, let me also uh, mention, because I'm, I'm doing some, some, uh, some research on this also, that, uh, of course, um, digitalization and digital tools also provide uh, additional channels and additional possibilities for democratic um, uh, for democracy and democratic behavior, uh, such as, for example, um, participation, digital participation or consultation. So actually, um, I'm, I would not, I, I just want to mention this because, for example, on the local level, uh, if you think in, of smart cities or um, uh, uh, local engagement uh, by um, uh, smaller scaled um, consultation, digital consultation, this can really bring an additional um, aspect into, into, yeah, into all levels of democracy. I, I, I think it's um, very valuable, especially on the local level, less on the national level and even lesser than on the European level. But I think there are uh, extremely, uh, a lot of examples where um, digital tools can really help to, to um, uh, encourage participation in decision-making and in deliberation and so on. So this is also one aspect uh, that we should mention because it's, it's already quite advanced. And um, it's especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, this is one of the positive, uh, also positive uh, mm -hmm. stories, so to say because all the solidarity, the neighborhood solidarity that, for example, in Germany uh, started to, to, um, to mushroom, so to say, uh, it was uh, also based on, on uh, people who were so innovative, uh, putting up uh, apps for neighborhood help uh, and so on. So this is also one side of, of digital communication. So um, just to mention it. I, I think we all agree on that, Mariana, but I wanna come back to one of the points you mentioned a bit earlier in your statement, which is, and brings me back to you to Ted again, which is the rule of law and listening to you, it just came up to my mind and popped up that part of what we see what's happening in social filter bubbles and social media is kind of outside the rule of law of our states in a sense of we can use hate speech in, in a filter bubble and nothing will happen. We can call someone really with all kinds of bad words and there won't be a follow-up. 
I mean, if, if I'm gonna, if I would say something really bad to you now, uh, Ted, you could see me and, and we have a recording, but in the field of battle, it's like a neutral stage. No one, not a national rule of law body is in charge. So is this another problem of democracy and digitalization that we don't have the tools, don't yet have the tools of a rule of law follow-up? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the internet has evolved in such a way that it's the wild west and there aren't enough guardrails rules to um, manage the content uh, in a way that respects democratic norms, human rights norms. And you know, Europe is ahead of anywhere else in the world in trying to get control of that problem. Um, but it's so obvious that it is a problem. Like, <laughs> I think we can agree on that. And we certainly, um, as much as there are some positives as Marianne mentioned, uh, when it comes to politics, um, it's it's made things worse, I think. And um, and then you add in issues of privacy and um, and you know the harassment of women and others. Um, it's it, it, it you know it, it's a sad reflection of human behavior too, right? And and this is why we have rules in the first place um, because. We know from history that um, humans are highly imperfect and need rules to get along. And um, wh why is the internet exempt from that? It, it doesn't make sense. So it's, it's time um, to insert a, uh, a legal regulatory system that balances all the various interests. And interestingly, you talk to the corporate sector in this space and they're getting it. They're trying to argue, well, we'll self-regulate. Don't worry, we've got all these monitors and sensors and um, systems for doing so. It's not enough. Um, you, you will need some kind of, and not to speak of artificial intelligence. And when that really takes off, we're gonna have a whole nother um, set of questions, difficult questions about you know, systems that are designed um, in which human control is further and further away. And, and that's a, a great concern. And so um, we've got some serious work to do ahead of us. Um, if I could just go a little bit further yeah. and in terms of rule of law, we have been um, conducting expert surveys and population polls around the world on rule of law for the last 10 years. And we see a number of factors of concern. Um, one is in the area of accountable governance, so that's critical to democracy, and um, particularly the role of independent auditors or civil society or the media, um, all under great pressure and stress and unable to provide that kind of check on executive power. That's a clear trend in most countries around the world. They got worse during the pandemic. Um, the most worrisome drop has been in the area of fundamental rights. Respect for fundamental rights has declined in most countries over the last five years. Um, trust in judicial institutions has also um, been declining, which is a real concern because I think the judicial sphere has been more or less, at least in the United States, up on a higher pedestal, but they're also becoming seen by publics here as more politicized. There's a very negative view toward law enforcement here in the United States. Um, and not surprising, you read the headlines about um, police violations of civil liberties and the lack of accountability. The, um, you know, I think there's greater consciousness now and people are beginning to address it um, and that's positive, but we have some serious work to do. Um, and then one other area to, to think about is access to justice, particularly civil justice. How do people deal with their everyday legal problems? This is the question of, is democracy performing well? Is it delivering what people need? And when you think about legal disputes in the United States, um, you know, let me get two thirds of Americans had a legal problem, but only one third could figure out a legal way to solve the problem. Um, and they didn't consult lawyers, and it had negative consequences for their health, their families, for their jobs. Um, so we have a big problem in this country when it comes to access to justice, not to speak of criminal justice, where very high levels of discrimination and bias in our criminal justice system 
The United States ranks 122nd out of 139 countries on this factor of our index, and it's getting worse. So, you know, the U.S., yes, we've got some strong things. We've got major things we need to work on. And I think it goes to this key question of trust in institutions, in elites, in establishment. It's been declining and eroding, and that's in part because government is not performing well, and it needs to do better. I think I, from my point of view, I fully agree with you, but on the other side, talking about access to justice, uh, what, what I very often, what my students ask me or I ask myself, and um, wanna just come back to Mariano with that, is that if we look at our legal system, also our constitution, our Grundgesetz in uh, Germany, we do have this fundamental right of individual freedom, the freedom of expression, the freedom of speech, the freedom for demonstrations, the freedom to express myself. And of course, the state, the government, the legal system is there to protect these freedoms, to protect these fundamental rights. And at least I believe in our legal system, the uh, judicial system here in Germany, that I as an individual German citizen do have access to the system and to sue someone or to claim my rights and to have justice to go to the courts. Uh, on the other side, I see that people who actually fight our democracy use exactly these freedom rights to fight and endanger democracy. And there's no legal follow-up on this because this is protected by the freedom of speech by the freedom of demonstration, by the freedom of expression of your own opinion. So Marianne, how do we solve this kind of dispute or this very critical aspect that from my point of view, I sometimes have the notion that we should kind of limit some specific freedom rights, which are actually guaranteed by our constitution in order to protect by our, our constitution from the people who use these rights to, find, to fight our democracy, to put our democracy in danger. I hope my question was clear because it's a bit yeah. difficult to explain that idea of the limitation of individual rights of freedom, which are, I think both guaranteed in the US constitution as well as in our uh, basic law, the Grundgesetz, and that of course people build upon this who actually want to fight the same constitution. Yeah, this is a very difficult balancing act, I would say, um, because on one side, uh, one hand side, and I agree completely with uh, Ted, um, we consider rule of law and a strong judicial system and a strong control and checks and balance, balances um, between, the, uh, between the powers, we consider it as fundamental and highly important and securing our individual freedoms and civil liberties. Um, so I think Ted and I, we both agree that we would be very reluctant to limit this um, principle of rule of law. Um, maybe um, different to United States, our German uh, legal system is working a bit better, I would say. <laughs> so um, it's um, in, in some parts, um, well, it, it's two different systems, of course, um, mm -hmm. but it's um, quite well performing, generally speaking, I would say, in at least in most of the uh, indices, uh, Germany is, is doing well uh, regarding um, its judicial system and rule of law. What concerns then, and again, Martin, it's a difficult balancing act, what you're, um, what you're referring to, because um, on one hand side, we do not want to limit this rule of law. And on the and the the freedoms and so on, and especially also in a, a crisis situation, because this makes democracies different to autocracies. Autocracies, or you know, or um, deficient democracies, or whatever you want to call it, they would exploit the emergency situation in terms of limiting exactly these freedoms and these liberties and these rights and. This exactly makes a difference of a good, well-working democracy that we still hold our principles uh, 
and hold to our principles. Um, and of course, I'm so worried, as you say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm living in, in our, our, my university is located in Dresden in, in Saxony, which is, of course, also um, a region where this problem is, um, is quite um, present. Uh, I, of course, I'm uh, concerned by this um, this kind of attitude, which bases on our freedoms, and at the same time uh, kicks them uh, with the feet. You know, uh, to to use a German expression, uh, this is this is a real dilemma. I would say this is a real dilemma. But the question is, how can we how can we deal with it? Uh, and my 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 hunch would be that this is not going to um, remain a single event. I, I would expect that this becomes a, um, a feature of our societies that, that we have this kind, this minority of, in Germany, it's about 10% uh, in, in, in the population, which, which is not uh, on the democratic, liberal, pluralist consensus, but anti-state, anti-democratic, anti-liberal, anti-pluralist. And I think we should um, expect that this will remain like this. So actually that the question is, um, how can, st or, are democracies strong enough to deal with it? So I think we should expect that this phenomenon is not going to vanish. So for me, the question is how can strong democracies deal with this kind of, of phenomenon? Thank you. Before I hand over to uh, Ted again, I just wanna ask our audience, whenever you have a question, please feel free and post it in the Q&A in the F&R Fragen and Antworten category down in Zoom. And uh, so, because we will be happy taking your questions, you can address your question even either to all of us or just to Ted or Marianne, whatever you are into. And if there's any important topic you want us to talk about, let us know. This is what a Q&A function is therefore because we cannot really see you and meet you in person, please you do use the Q&A function to get in with your questions. But taking up what Mariana just said, Ted, I mean, I remember about a year ago, those shocking pictures with storming the Capitol, which again was such a minority, which just, let's say, produced media images and a media event, but also was reported to be a shock for American democracy. Let's say if we if we agreed with Mariana saying this could happen again, maybe not a storming of the Capitol, but maybe a similar event. Is there an idea, do we need to train people to understand democracy, to be good Democrats? Yes, for sure. And, and I do want to say a bit more about that. I'm glad. Yeah, you, go ahead. Feel free. I'm, I'm glad you raised um, what happened in this country just a year ago. It, it was the culmination of a series of events that um, laid the groundwork for that kind of violent action. I think it was a particular mix of um, volatile um, lies that were being propagated about the election results that um, enraged people who believed the lie and felt that they had to take action no matter what kind of uh, cost. And so um, it wasn't just a group of citizens doing a protest. It, it was a part of a, a much bigger network. Yeah. Who, who gets to hold power in the White House uh, was the heart of it. And there's nothing more important in this country and therefore um, it was toxic in the way it all played out. Um, I was shocked. Uh, I wasn't in Washington that day. I was watching it on television from somewhere else. Absolutely shocked. Never thought anything like that could happen in the United States. What I'm even more shocked about is the lack of accountability for these acts. 
and the partisan way in which one party has approached that question. When members of Congress themselves who were hiding behind chairs and desks from very violent people, nonetheless decided not to accept the electoral count, decided not to hold the president, former president accountable, we are seeing a steady series of prosecutions against some of the more violent actors, and that is positive. Um, and they're hoping to build a case that will really unveil some of the key actors behind the scenes. But every day you read in the newspaper how a group of citizens were storing weapons just across the river here in Virginia and ready to call them in once they got the signal. This was a, a, an organized, if incompetent, thank God, approach to stopping our constitutional government from doing its basic core function of handing power over peacefully. There's nothing more, it's like a cardinal sin against democracy in my view. And the fact that we cannot even get political consensus about that fact and holding people accountable to me is a, is a major concern when it comes to rule of law in this country. Um, and how we're going to dig out of it. And on top of that, the person who was leading this charge is the leading candidate, of, you know, the leader of the party and likely to run for president again. And it's just, it's just hard to understand. So there is a problem with our education system, clearly. I'm all for freedom of, of assembly, or freedom of association and free speech. But um, there need to be some boundaries when it comes to hate speech and violent behavior. And, I and whether it's from the left or the right, regardless. And so um, our system of civic education, this is what so impressed me in Germany. You, you all have a much more um, sophisticated and deliberate system from you know, young age through. We do not in this country. Civic education is not taught as a subject in this country. You learn US history as a child, but even the telling of U.S. history has now become so contested politically with the issue of slavery and how we tell that story that we can't even get the basic story um, right, let alone the, the understanding of what those principles mean. And um, this is another reason why I think democracy is truly in crisis in this country. Um, and there are various um, initiatives to improve civic education in this country. It will take some time. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, it, we're going to have to um, uh, count on the courts and prosecutors to, to put down some guardrails uh, when it gets out of hand. Yeah, we have a, a first question coming in. Thanks, Ted. And I just want to take the question in because it kind of uh, fits in. It's from uh, Fidan Soya asking, it's not addressed specifically to, to one of us or one of you, so both of you are free to answer. Do you agree with this quote? We don't need more democracy, we need more Democrats. And if so, how specifically can, we, can Democrats be educated? So looking at both of you, your mic's open. Ted, you want to kind of come in on that and then maybe an additional oh. comment from Mariana? You know, I think this builds off my last point. Yes, I agree. We need more small D Democrats. Yeah, that's why I took this question in. Yeah, and, um, and it does start at a young age, but it needs to be reinforced. Uh, and it starts with the family. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt's famous quote about human rights begins at home uh, is so true. And I think there is a sociological debate about the breakdown of the family and uh, where a lot of that learning happens um, is maybe not happening as well as it could be. And then the classrooms are becoming even now, especially with COVID and masks and mandates becoming very contested grounds, um, including over racial history and justice in, in this country. Um, although it's good to have that as a way to inculcate an idea of critical thinking and debate, constructive debate. And I think that's very inherent to the American system and the mindset here. You're always gonna have skeptics and questioning and, and that's healthy, I think. Uh, but 
it's usually based on some common understanding of the rules and the facts, and that's where things are breaking down. Mariana. Yes, I, I think also, I mean, I can, can only agree that, of course, education is, is critical. And um, yeah, we have in Germany this very special system, which is unique, I think, in, in, in the world. <laughs> People tell me at least uh, that it is unique. We have a, very, a lot of state-funded initiatives and so on. This is due to our history. Um, uh, and we did well uh, to to have them and we do well to have them um and i i also can agree only to ted i mean it's it's um it's family and it's the schools uh where um civic education um has to start and i think um looking also at this polarization we have been talking about uh, some minutes before um what we can observe is that people are not willing to, to compromise anymore. Uh, I think compromise, for example, is a, is a very important word. Uh, children have to learn, we all have to learn that, of course, there's always this, um, the possibility to have different opinions and to exchange them and to, to, to struggle uh, uh, with different opinions and positions. But that this has to be firstly civically, so it has to be without violence. This is the first thing uh, I think, which should be so clear and obvious also that um, uh, um, competition of ideas is something that is uh, um, put into reality without violence. And the second thing is that um, consensus and compromise also has to be part of discussion. So discussion is good, but there also has to be the willingness to, to, to consensus and to compromise. And I think what is decreasing, I see some, some tendency that people are not willing to, to, this, to these two uh, aspects. Well, violence is a different thing, maybe. Uh, this is really a minority which um, uh, um, uh, uh, makes violence uh, a tool of their um, uh, their um, public expressions and so on. But the willingness to compromise, I think this is something which is also um, decreasing. And I, these are all values. I think they're so natural, so obvious for us, uh, but they have to be, as I said, democracy is really the most demanding and onerous and um, uh, requiring uh, political system, and and this is also part of democracy to to um, keep up the values. Thank you, Mariana. I think we all agree. And if I may add, I think it's not only this yeah ability, the skills to compromise, but also the skills of active listening. This is what I very often noticed lately that people simply do no longer listen to each other and therefore they also miss the arguments people are using. We do have a follow-up question again from Fidan Soya for you, Ted. Should the American school system do a better job of teaching civic education in schools? How can we make the classroom more democratic? I'm not an expert on this field, yeah. but I know from my own experience and my children's experience that um, it, it, it isn't as much as it should be and more work needs to be done. Our, our education system is very decentralized. So curriculum is controlled at the local level. Um, and I don't mean just at the state level, but including like very local. And there are school boards that are elected and they decide um, based on some state standards what is taught in the classroom. And there's a lot of fighting going on right now over critical race theory, um, the idea that we should take a more critical perspective on US history when it comes to slavery and other race injustice issues. And you read the stories and there is a backlash from certain sectors of society who are getting involved in very local politics and running for seats on school boards so that they can change the curriculum and not allow any teaching of these concepts in our classrooms. So there's like a counter revolution almost going on. Um, and 
it's not everywhere in the country, but it is happening. And next door in Virginia, um, the governor who was just elected a Republican uh, argued very passionately on this case that parents should control what their children are taught in school, not the state. And parents should decide whether their kids wear masks at school, not the state. So we have this very strong libertarian streak in our culture, but it's more than that. We have a threatened elite white Christian community here that is shrinking and they feel under attack and they're punching back. I think that's, that's real. Thanks for this additional insight. I'm just gonna stay with the questions now because they keep coming in. There's one question from uh, Julian Seller from Tübingen University, again addressed to you, uh, Ted. Uh, it says, good evening, I am Julian Seller at the moment studying American studies at Tübingen University, not far away from Stuttgart. My question is, how could people that are being drawn into extremism or rallied up on January 6th last year by groups like the Proud Boys and others be approached? Do you have any idea how to get them back into society and to fair discourse? Maybe, yeah, again, directed to Mr. Piconin, so it's yours, Ted. Well, I'm, I'm interested in hearing Marianne's perspective yeah. on this as well, um, given the, the debates in Germany. But I would say in the United States, um, there is a certain faction of society that will are, are radicalized and radicalizing others and are going to be hard to persuade. And those folks who bring weapons into the halls of Congress to attack Congress people have to be punished. It's a, it's a blatant violation of the law and they have to serve time in jail. There's no question in my mind about that. And maybe they'll learn, maybe they won't, but they have to be held accountable. And I think that also we hope will have a, an effect on others. Um, for those that are maybe more persuadable, this is where the media environment comes in. And unfortunately, it's become very fragmented. And so you have certain news um, actors on the right and the left that are in this bubble and reinforcing uh, very misleading, if not outright falsehoods uh, of what the truth is. And I think until that gets fixed, um, we, I don't honestly know um, how we're going to persuade people. Now, then there's a middle ground where I think there are some, there are various initiatives. Um, they're called different third way, purple coalitions, um, pragmatic coalitions, uh, platforms to encourage more conversation. The media, some of the media is also trying to get out of their own bubble and talk to people in different parts of the country to understand better what they're thinking is, why is support for President Trump so strong? Um, and I think that all is, is positive. It's a learning process. And um, the last thing I guess is that people, you know, our leaders need to lead by example. There needs to be a different kind of approach to our politics where there's actual some kind of civility in the way people talk to each other. And I don't know what else to say, then let's, let's hope they, they learn how to do that. Yeah, Mariana, you wanna come in on that? Yeah, I think it's very, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very important what Ted said in his last sentences. I think um, uh, democracy needs uh, demo Democrats, but the Democrats uh, are the leaders as well as the citizens. It's it's not only that, you know, it's, it's the overall picture. So what we need is um, elites that really lead by example. I think this is really so important. Um, and we can see that also in, in other countries than the United States, uh, look at Brazil, Bolsonaro, for example, and, and other countries where, um, yeah, where you simply you simply uh, are are consternated uh, <laughs> looking at the behavior of of uh, leaders uh, like uh, like uh, them. So actually, this leading by example, I think it's very important uh, concerning the elites, and then citizens, of course, they. Um, 
it has to come from themselves, uh, bottom up, but uh, they look at the leaders. And uh, I think that uh, the, the way of how leaders communicate, uh, again, if leaders, for example, are themselves an example for compromise, for example, uh, this is very important because this is something that, that citizens then uh, socialize with. And um, so I think this is a, a really important point um, that um, a lot of leaders are failing in this regard also. I think one aspect of maybe failing leaders is also a lack of reaction of some specific leaders, political leaders. And I think this is what the next question from a, it's without a name, anonymous, uh, again to you. I think it's been partly answered already by you, Ted. The question is one year after the end at Capitol Hill, has there been any official condemnation or apology on the part of the Republican party overall? We know the answer is no, but <laughs> yeah, just the just the opposite. There's been a perpetuation of what we call the big lie about who won the elections, and um, the inability for Congress to that was directly attacked to have a bipartisan approach to investigating the incident is another indication of how far away we are from it. So in the end. And the, the House of Representatives has a special investigative committee and the Republican Party leadership refused to cooperate with the body. And instead you have, I think it's two or three uh, dissenting Republicans who have joined the investigation and um, Liz Cheney being one of them and the former vice president's daughter. And I have to say, you know, she and I, would not agree on a lot of things, but she is showing how to lead by example. She is standing up for the rule of law and she's speaking very frankly about it. And there, so there is a contest within the Republican party on some of these um, points and principles, but the upper hand is with Trump and his accolades. And it's, it's, it's shameful in my view. I, I don't understand it. It says something about how elections happen in this country. Politicians are elected in primaries to win the party nomination before the general election. And the primaries are being contested on very polarizing grounds. So because people are clustered in their own um, bubbles, they're competing for a narrow segment of the electorate, say on the right or the left, and not for a broad cross-section diverse group of people. And so the base um, to get elected to win that primary, you have to play to the base. And this is generating candidates who are more extreme in their politics. And then they bring that to the general election and then to the Congress. And this is a fundamental fault in our structure um, in the way we do elections and the way we gerrymander, the way we draw the lines for electoral districts. This is what I mean, that we have certain features of our democracy that are making the problem worse, not better. Yeah, and what are we describing is basically also a, a systematic approach which leads to, towards polarization, what both mm -hmm. of you mentioned earlier. And this is the next question coming in from Maya Moritz. Can both speakers address the role of special interests in polarization and threats to democracy in their respective countries? Maybe we're gonna start with Mariana now to give Ted a brief break. <laughs> I actually do not fully capture the, uh, the question, I, I'm afraid. Um, the question or shall I read it again? Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, Maya Moritz maybe explains um, what she refers to when, when she says special interests. Yeah, special interest I, groups and polarization or maybe the phenomenon of polarization, what both of you mentioned earlier, that we have an increasing level of polarization and actually mm -hmm. we do need to depolarize in our society. So... Okay, I. So the role of increasing polarization uh, or she comes in. Maya just ah. wrote. I'm referring to lobbyists, political donors, and money interests. 
which is a little bit what Ted mentioned earlier, that there's a lot of, let's call it black money around that. Uh, we have rumors about mm. corruption. There's a lack of transparency. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think, actually, speaking of Germany, uh, I cannot speak, uh, well, Ted will speak of the United States. But if we are talking about polarization, actually, uh, what we can, can observe is that a lot of this polarization is about, is based on cultural reasons. So it's this... Um, Partly it's eco economic also, but it's it's a lot culturally uh, motivated. So people are, we have new cleavages, we have new conflict lines, so to say, in, in the Western societies, especially here in, in Western Europe. Uh, and this is about uh, cultural, um, uh, cultural um, cleavages, which is on the one hand side, we have people who are cosmopolitan, uh, who are open-minded, who are inclusively thinking. So uh, people who would, for example, be open to um, um, uh, gender ideas, to LGBTI uh, uh, things and so on. And then we have on the other hand side, those people who are more uh, nationalist, authoritarian, traditional values based and so on. So this kind of polarization, which is very, yeah, very uh, important in this regard, um, is is not well. Lobbyists and and special interest groups do not have so much influence on this kind of polarization. So I I do not see a linkage here actually. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, not for Germany and not for the Western European and or yeah for the European countries in general. It's more mm -hmm. about this value difference and value cleavages. Do you agree, Ted? Yeah, I, on this last point, I would say in the United States, it's a very important role played by religious institutions in promoting traditional values, and I think that runs against the um, trend toward more open and inclusive. Uh, approaches to, to, to society and culture. But in our system, there's another factor. Uh, I don't know in Germany, but the, as I said, campaign money and politics, it's basically a form of legalized corruption, in my view, in which special interests are able to donate money to candidates, parties, or what we call political action committees, which is a legal creature that allows um, corporations or other rich individuals to make donations for political causes and hide their identity. They do not have to declare who they are in funding these kinds of political campaigns. They cannot directly, if, if you give money to a candidate, you must declare yourself. But if you give party to these other bodies, then it's hidden. And so we have a huge influence by special interests who use those mechanisms to um, uh, influence politics and manipulate it. Now, they have every right to do so. Um, as I said, it's legal to do so. And this is where our um, judicial and political institutions are failing to um, understand the danger associated with that and how it goes against the public, the public interests. So, you know, this is why some candidates can, um, are very proud to campaign and say, I will not take any corporate money. I have most of my donors are small donations. I'm a populist, I'm with the people kind of approach, but that's unfortunately the minority because it's so expensive to run campaigns. We don't, we have very minimal public financing of campaigns. And that's another problem with our system. Yeah, which is a very, very negative, but I, I'm just... American <laughs> system, yeah. <laughs> the there are two more questions coming in from uh, Fida and Soya, and they are basically touching upon the same subject, which is more uh, different systems of democracy. The first question is, is direct democracy a solution to make democracy more stable and bring democracy out of danger? And the other question, again from uh, Fidan Soya, uh, because I think you, Marianne, were talking about liberal democracy. 
So linked to that first question about direct democracy as a solution, the second question is, is liberal democracy the best? If so, why do other countries reject this form of government? Maybe Mariana, you want to come in on that? Yeah. Uh, the first question is direct democracy a solution. Um, simple answer, no. <laughs> In my point of view, not. Um, imagine, imagine with the level of polarization that Ted and I have been describing, you would put public decision making to the people. I mean, this would be really interesting to put it very euphemistic. Huh? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I could elaborate on this uh, two hours, but I, I will spare this, but I, I don't think that this is a solution. Um, there, we, we, have to, we have to, as Ted said, we have serious uh, tasks to do. And I think, uh, let me say this, one of the points why I'm a little bit optimistic about democracy in general is that what we learn over the, um, over the um, thousands of years of the last um, uh, hundreds of years is that the advantage of democracy is that democracies are learning systems. So what I expect, and this is my hope, that out of the multiple crises that have been described here by us, there comes out some kind of innovative new channels that can be, you know, the way out of this crisis also, because this is what we learn. This is what we know. This is our knowledge that democracy is most more adaptive, more learning that autocracies are. And, and this is also the hope. Okay. So the next question uh, is the one about, about liberal democracy. Yeah, exactly. Why do other countries reject this form of government? Well, very simple, because it's, um, it's uh, authoritarian-minded leaders. Um, this is the uh, phenomenon I was describing in the beginning that are, um, uh, that are driving democracies to uh, a different kind of um, uh, system, which is authoritarian. And, and people simply do not have much choice about that. Um, this, is, this is quite clear. I mean, um, look at China. Um, even if these people think they are happy with what they have, they would not have a chance to change anything. So um, actually, um, they do not have a chance to vote or to opt for liberal democracy. And maybe let me add one thing. We have some uh, global surveys looking at Latin America, looking at Sub-Sahara Africa and looking at Asia and asking people what, they, um, um, what their connotation with democracy is. So what they uh, link to democracy. And the interesting thing is um, that over all regions in the world, most of the people, what they connotate with democracy is freedom. Freedom is the word that is, is always ranking first when you ask people, uh, what is democracy for you? So most of the people in the world, be it in democracies or not, they understand democracy as freedom. And this is what they're striving to. So actually, um, the only way you can have freedom <laughs> in this understanding is liberal democracy. I could see in Ted's face that he <laughs> in basically agrees with what we said. And uh, just with respect of time, I know that Ted has some follow-up appointments after our discussion today, and it's like 2.30 in the afternoon in the US now. So I just wanna ask you, Ted, and you, Marianne, another question, which is, how it's from, again, an anonymous member of the audience. How would you assess the impact of COVID on the state of democracy in Europe and in the United States? Do you want to start with that, Ted? 
Yeah, I think it's a, it's a long answer that we don't have time for. I mean, I think we alluded to it earlier. There's no question it's had, I think, both direct and indirect consequences for democracy. The functioning of, of institutions have certainly been harmed. Um, and also the um, contestation of what is the role of the state in managing public health crises and emergencies. Uh, I think that is um, much more polarizing than I thought it would be. Like you have uh, an emergency that is affecting everyone, you would think would bring people together towards some solidarity and common approach. And here in the United States it's, and in many other countries, it's had the opposite effect. And um, I think partly because freedom, people want as much autonomy as possible in their lives. And it's, it's, they have to give something back to their neighbors, their community, their, you know, others to wear a mask and to not fly and all those other rules. People don't like rules uh, in general in our, in our societies. In other societies, in, like in, in Asia, I would say, democracy is about stability in many ways. It's about um, lack of conflict, it's, you know, and, you know, democracy appears chaotic and um, arbitrary and they don't like that. And so that's, so maybe I could just end in, on that kind of point. I agree hundred percent on direct democracy, though there are times when it could be useful on, on local questions, but liberal democracy, I mean, is it worth fighting for? You know, I answer that in two ways. One is that, and I fighting mean peacefully, nonviolently. Um, <laughs> one is that it's a good in and of itself because democracy is the best system for protecting our rights and our human dignity and creativity, really. And then there are instrumental arguments for democracy, at least when you look at the historical record. The democ liberal democracies, strong liberal democracies, do better on many other factors. They're more peaceful, less conflict. There is um, more economic prosperity. Uh, there is better health, and uh, particularly for women and children, actually. There are a number of indicators. I've done a number of studies and, and published some of this work at, at Brookings, and the record is pretty strong for liberal democracy. Um, and the reason autoc autocrats don't want it is because they don't want to share power in my view, it's very simple. It's human greed and um, that's the heart of the problem because democracy is about sharing power. Marianne, I think you agree. Do you wanna come briefly in on that? I think this was a wonderful last word and I only can agree to everything that uh, Ted said. I agree that is really, has been was a wonderful last word. Uh, sorry to those who just put in some answer, some questions which we couldn't answer, but I think we can, uh, yeah, give an update later on. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Ted, for your input today. I know that you have to run to another appointment, another meeting. Thank you, Marianne. And now I hand the floor back to Christiana. <laughs> yeah, thank you very, very much, Martin, and of course. Thank you all for this really impressive uh, exchange and um, which actually has presented so many aspects of the subject and, and so much expertise. And actually, I, I maybe you agree, but we should have, uh, offer an entire seminar yeah, with yeah. those three of you. So um, let's think about it. That um, would be really wonderful. So thanks again. And um, just because you've mentioned uh, what most people think uh, when when the democracy, the, the word comes up. And um, so what the eighth graders today were thinking most of in our um, workshop, I've mentioned in the beginning, um, we had suddenly had friendship in the in the word cloud. Yeah, they all put in friendship. Yeah, not freedom, but for them, democracy means friendship. The, the um, opportunity yeah, to be friend. Yeah, other people. And that's really a very, very nice way to put it. Yeah, and to think about democracy. And thank you all for, for answering the, the question <laughs> we asked today whether democracy is in danger and um, also the many ways you um, 
show that to we could protect it and um, I think it's really cannot be emphasized often enough that democracy is worth protecting and must be protected and also that that protection is actually work for everybody who is interested in this um, um, yeah way to uh, live yeah and um, and communicating the good reasons to stand up for democracy is not always easy, especially in our times. And so at this point, once again, a big thank you for doing that. <laughs> and also thank you to uh, goes out to our audience for listening and asking so many interesting and good questions. And also once again, thank you to our cooperation partner, the Landeszentrale für politische Bildung. And so finally, please let me do some advertisement for upcoming DAZ program. I'll be quick. So starting next week on February 3rd, we will be part of the Digital Film Festival this year. It will be digital due to COVID, uh, the Indiana Inuit North America Film Festival. So, and if you are, and I hope you will be interested in even more events we do, so please just go and visit our website, www.dac.org. So, thanks again, Marianne, Ted, and Martin. And to all of you, including our listeners, have a great evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care and be back. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.